Hello and welcome to USBC's webinar series, Commercial uh, Milk Formula Marketing, International Contacts and Tools. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Amelia pismith seeger US Breastfeeding Committee's Deputy Director. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa, and welcome everyone. It looks if you can advance the slide. All right, so as many of you likely know, this is the 40th anniversary of the International Code of the Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. And we wanted to just recap a little bit today how we got here. So, you know, at USBC, we really understand and believe that all large scale change initiatives begin with a shared learning experience. And so we started with learning from our member organizations. So in 2019, we conducted a survey of those organizations and the survey findings demonstrated a fractured understanding of the code. Essentially, we didn't all have the same view of what the code is, what it isn't, what it means and what to do with it. So the following year, we planned a webinar series to support a shared learning journey. And in late 2020, member organizations expressed interest in active engagement on this topic, which led us earlier this year to convening a conversation that we call an incubation conversation, which is USBC's first step in testing if we have the collective will and the capacity to form an action-focused work group, which we call a constellation. Next slide, Alyssa. So here we are uh, with our shared learning journey. This is a series of three webinars called Unpacking Commercial Milk Formula Marketing, Communities, Contexts, and Impacts. And today is the first webinar in this series focusing on international contexts and tools. All right, so Dr. Lawrence Grummerstron so that's today. He is the head of the Food and Nutrition Actions and Health Systems Unit at the World Health Organization, or WHO. He is responsible for WHO work on infant and young child nutrition, treatment of acute malnutrition, and prevention of micronutrient deficiencies. Having earned his PhD from Princeton University, he has published over 180 scientific publications. Many of us are familiar with Larry from his prior work before going to WHO, where he served as chief of the nutrition branch at the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where he led the Surgeon General's Call to Action on Breastfeeding, the CDC Guide to Breastfeeding Interventions, Breastfeeding Monitoring through the National Immunization Survey, the State Breastfeeding Report Card, the Maternity Care Practice and Infant Nutrition Care, or MPINC survey, and the second Infant Feeding Practices Study. He's recognized internationally for his work on vitamin and mineral deficiencies, breastfeeding policy, and development of both the CDC and WHO growth charts. At WHO, he coordinates the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, and the Global Breastfeeding Collective. So they can join me in thanking Larry for being here. Our other speaker this morning is Rachel Crossley. I'm very pleased to have Rachel here today. I've been um, keen to have the Access to Nutrition Initiative present to our field um, for several years now. I'm so delighted that this has all come to, come to be. So Rachel has more than 20 years of experience working at the nexus of sustainability, business, and responsible investment. Prior to working with Access to Nutrition Initiative, or ATNI, she was a director of two leading UK responsible investment teams with an, a large UK asset managers. In those roles, she was responsible for designing and leading shareholder engagement programs on behalf of more than 100 billion pounds of client investments on a wide range of environmental and social issues, including consumer health and nutrition. She's the author of numerous corporate benchmarks and reports, including several looking at the response of the food and beverage sector to obesity and diet related chronic diseases on which ATNI draws. She also has extensive experience in developing, managing and participating in multi-stakeholder initiatives and has held numerous positions on not-for-profit boards and committees. So we are very honored to have both of these distinguished speakers with us today to lead our first webinar series. All right, so first up is Larry. Okay. 
Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be back with the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee after a, a number of years of absence. I hope that uh, many of you in the audience um, remember other times that I might have spoken with the group and, and interacted with you. Um, so it's happy to, to, to be sharing that again to, to this time. Um, my task today is to give a bit of an overview of the code. As you've seen, there's going to be a series of webinars, so you'll have other opportunities to learn other nuances and such, but uh, give a little bit of the, the background of where it came from, what's actually in the code, um, and give you a little bit of an idea of where we're going, uh, going forward um, with, with some new actions around the code. Um, so I think it's always important to start with the, the why. Um, I can't go into all of the impacts of marketing. Um, it's quite obvious that uh, if companies weren't um, benefiting from the marketing that they were doing, uh, then they wouldn't be spending billions of dollars on it. And definitely the formula industry is spending billions of dollars on the marketing of their products. People usually think about the impact in terms of what it does to the mothers. They think of this as marketing to moms. And that certainly is the primary target of the marketing. Um, and some of the messages that you, we, we get through that is an equivalency where they try to, to position the formula products as being almost as good or just as good as formula, uh, or that it's going to meet the needs or the benefits that it uh, brings to the mother because it meets her needs in a, in a, in a difficult time with her baby. Um, this marketing has the, the impact of um, eroding her confidence and her own breastfeeding with messages like, if you're able to, uh, but when you need us, we're there. Um, and tries to position the companies as a trusted source. So some of that marketing isn't even about the products themselves, um, but they try to position that the company is, a, is it knows about children's nutrition. Um, it's where you should turn to for um, the expertise. Um, and therefore, when mothers um, reach, reach difficult times, uh, rather than going to their clinicians or going to a lactation consultant for help, um, they might turn to the companies because they're a trusted source. So those are some of the main concerns we are with mothers. Um, but I think that people don't realize how much the, the marketing also impacts society in general. And so the various things that we try to do to support breastfeeding are also impacted by that, that marketing. So the networks that mothers are in, so the kind of advice that she gets from her own mother or mother-in-law or her spouse or her friends um, are also shaped by what they're seeing with, with that marketing. And so if they get that message that, well, formula is just as good as formula anyway, so why are you working so hard at this? Why, does, why do you care? Um, she's going to internalize some of those messages as well. Healthcare providers would be less interested in um, investing their time and getting education about how to support breastfeeding if they get messages that, well, it's just as good, or if they've been educated by the companies um, at all the meetings that they go to about those products, then it's much more easy for them to, to recommend those products. Employers, why should they um, give, go out of their way to accommodate a mother who's coming back to work or give her longer maternity leave if it's really a personal choice um, that the companies are just saying, well, it, it's up to her what she wants to do. Um, legislators, why should they invest more in breastfeeding if it's just as good? Why should they make sure that we're having good legislation um, protecting mothers um, if, it, if it really doesn't matter? We know that this marketing is incredibly successful. Um, it was last estimated as being $60 billion in 2018 with a projection to rise to $119 billion industry by 2025. That represents a 10% annual growth um, per year, right? annual per, per year, um, which is huge compared to most other products. Um, so clearly this marketing is really working extremely well. By way of history, um, we, we go back to the 1970s when there was a, a good recognition of the problems uh, of, the, of this marketing and needing to, to step into it. Um, the World Health Organization established this code in 1981 with the World Health Assembly um, endorsing that we really have to clamp down on this, uh, the, the way that these products are marketed. Um, and, in, and since 1981, there have actually been 20 subsequent resolutions, essentially every two years since then, um, there have been either modifications or calls to action um, to make sure that we're continuing to see the importance of the code or to address certain issues that have come up. Um, so there are certain kind of loopholes or things that weren't as clear in the original code that needed to be clarified. So issues of the donation of supplies, how we deal with the, these supplies in emergency situations, um, address issues on conflicts of interest, how we monitor the code. Um, the duration of exclusive breastfeeding was originally written when we were recommending four months of exclusive breastfeeding, um, so that needed to be changed. 
um, issues around nutrition and health claims on the labels and in materials, um, risks of powdered infant formula, the follow-up formula, so defining what we mean by formula uh, or breast milk substitutes. Um, healthcare provisions, cross promotion, these kinds of things have all been modified with subsequent resolutions on the code. And so when we talk about the code, we need to recognize we're not just looking at the way it was written in 1981, it has to be seen in light of all of the subsequent clarifications and modifications to that. But I want people to recognize that this is not an old issue. This is not something that happened 40 years ago, uh, that these companies were doing inappropriate things, but now we're all past that. Now they're all ethical companies. Um, and it's, we see these um, examples of violations of the code all the time in country, countries all around the world, um, certainly not least in the United States. Um, and even in COVID, we've seen the companies really taking advantage of this to market their products by giving out free samples um, for communities that might be affected by it, um, holding up clinicians as the experts um, where the clinicians are speaking out about the, the, the reasons why you might need to use formula during the, 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 the pandemic if you're, you're affected, um, that are clearly counter messages um, against what the World Health Organization and UNICEF have recommended, um, but the companies are putting these out there as if they're um, scientific advice. Um, they're positioning themselves as the experts on how to protect babies from coronavirus. And sometimes there aren't even direct messages, um, but they're just positioning themselves as we're the good guys in this pandemic. So we're on your side uh, without even saying anything about the products themselves. So we need to talk about what actually is in the code. Um, it starts off talking about the aim being the protection and promotion of breastfeeding, um, but also to ensure that the proper use of breast milk substitutes is there when it is needed. Um, and this, this is based on adequate information and appropriate marketing. Um, so they're not saying that we don't want to have breast milk substitutes. The code itself um, is very clear in recognizing there is a need for this and that there is a need for access to breast milk substitutes. Um, so we have to differentiate when we talk about the code, we're not being anti-formula, we're being anti-formula marketing in the way that it's being promoted and pushed on women to change their, their, uh, their decisions. The code then goes into the scope, talks about what is included. Um, initially, it wasn't so clear when they talked about breast milk substitutes, um, but this was clarified in 2016. Uh, we really picked apart what products are included, um, and those would be products up through zero to 36 months of age. Um, and I want to make a comment that I'm using the word breast milk substitutes because this is a terminology that is used in the code and in, in the subsequent resolutions. Um, but many people have, have found real concern about that term as if substitute implies an equivalency that, well, if you don't want to breastfeed, well, here's the substitute that you can put in, in, in its place. Um, and many people are now saying we need to be shifting the, the language around this to be talking specifically about milk formulas um, and use the word commercial around it to really recognize that this is not a matter of natural ways of feeding, but this is a commercial product that is stepping in in this context. And that's why uh, we propose this title of commercial milk formulas, um, even though we're kind of stuck with the, the legal language that's in the old documents. The code also covers um, commercial uh, uh, complementary foods if those are promoted in the first six months of life um, because those clearly com compete and are a replacement for breast milk and so those are covered, um, as well as feeding bottles and teats. And we can come back to that issue a little bit later. Um, the code covers um, in information and educational materials, um, and it makes it clear that this needs to be the responsibility of governments. It's not the responsibility of companies to tell mothers about how they should feed their babies. Um, what it does spell out is that those information and educational materials um, need to include um, per pertinent information about breastfeeding um, and why that cr critically needs to be part of any information that, that is shared with mothers. Um, but it also lays out things that should not be part of that information. Um, and so there shouldn't be any text or pictures that would idealize breast milk substitutes. So there might be a need in educational materials coming from governments to talk about infant formula and why it might be needed in certain circumstances, but it needs to do it in a way that doesn't make it look like that is the better option. There's an article in the code about promotion to the public, and it basically is a very broad, uh, uh, broad uh, stipulation that there should be no advertising or any promotion to the general public at all. 
and it doesn't spe specify that it has to, you know, under, you know, only billboards or television ads being covered by that. And so even digital marketing, which is increasingly of concern to us, um, should be covered by the code because that is another form of promotion to the general public. It also spells out that there should be no samples given to families of, of products. There should be no gifts or promotional articles or utensils, buy one, get one free, or you can have this teddy bear um, if, you, if you buy our product. Um, there shouldn't be any direct contact with marketing personnel or indirect person or indirect contact. So 1-800-LINES um, to call and get information about infant feeding uh, or nurses coming into the hospital to talk about their products um, should all be um, disallowed by the code. It has a section for the retail um, that basically says that there should be no promotional devices used in retail environments, and that would include special display, displays to, to, to advertise the products, coupons that might be given out, premiums, special sales, lost leaders, so you can get a, a lower price for this if you buy something else or to get you into the store, tie-in sales where you're combining it with the, the sales of other products, et cetera. A lot of text in the code um, about healthcare workers um, and a number of the subsequent resolutions have talked about the importance of restricting the marketing um, to healthcare workers and through healthcare workers. Um, it covers issues about um, scientific and factual matters is the only kind of information that can be provided. So there can't be any promotional materials shared with healthcare providers. Um, there should be no inducements to promote products um, that would be offered to the healthcare workers. So they can't say things like, um, if you're able to get your, your, your uh, uh, clients or, or your patients um, to, to use our product more, we'll give you this kind of a kickback. Um, no free or subsidized supplies can be given to healthcare workers for their use um, with, within their clinics. Um, no donation of equipment or services that can be provided. Um, and no sponsorship of any healthcare meetings. Um, this last one was just added in 2016, and it still needs to be clarified um, as to exactly what, what is included in, in sponsorship. Um, but this is a, a, an area of key interest for WHO right now, because increasingly we find that healthcare providers' advice to mothers is shaped by the kind of sponsorship that they have at their meetings. There also should be no promotion in the healthcare facilities, so not just directed to the mothers themselves or to the healthcare workers themselves, um, but they can't come into the facility and promote their products as kind of a, a, a by service. Um, no gifts can be given out, no coupons, incentives to healthcare staff or to caregivers through those health facilities, um, no company contacts with mothers in the healthcare, healthcare system, so we can't have companies offering to come, we'll do education for your patients for you. Um, no host events or contests or campaigns. The code also covers labeling, the required information that has to be on the label, key messages about the importance of breastfeeding. Um, and it also lays out that there cannot be any pictures or text that idealizes breast milk substitutes. That's covered in both the informational supplies as, as well as the, the labeling. Um, and subsequent resolutions talked about that there can be no nutrition and health claims on these products. And then finally, we need to think about, well, who are the actors uh, for the code? Um, it clearly was directed at the actions of the manufacturers and distributors of breast milk substitutes as a primary actor to change the way that they do their marketing uh, of their products and the way they sell their products. Um, but it's important to recognize that the code doesn't just call on them. It also calls on the health workers and health systems that they have their own responsibility to adhere to this. It calls on national governments to put this into national legislation. But it is clear, and subsequent resolutions have been clear, that even when governments do not take the action that is needed to put this into legislation and regulations, that does not mean that the manufacturers are off the hook. Healthcare workers are not off the hook. So when they say, oh, we're complying with the code because we comply with national law, that does not make sense. The code itself calls upon them to be the actors. It calls on the United Nations agencies to monitor the code and to disseminate information about it. Uh, works with, work with non-governmental organizations to support um, and hold us all accountable to that. Subsequent resolutions have also called on the media and creative industries to not be used for this marketing either, so they have their own responsibility. I want to transition now to talk about some of the, the, the new activities that WHO is engaged in um, to, to really push some of this forward and look at the code in some new ways. 
Um, so we currently have a large research activity um, that's multi-country, working in eight countries around the globe to really look at mother's experiences with that marketing. Um, so we've seen a lot of studies over the time about how industry has violated the code and where we're seeing that it's not being followed. Um, but there hasn't been as much work on well, what does this actually do to women? Do they actually pick up these messages or do they just say, OK, you know, I, I see the marketing out there, but it's not going to affect me. Um, really looking at how it does affect the way that they think, the, the kinds of uh, behaviors that they, they engage in, the influences that they have of uh, the uh, women around them, the family and friends that they have, the health workers, and their messages. So really seeing how this marketing is actually working. We're also doing research on digital marketing. The World Health Assembly last year called on us to do, to do a report on how marketing is changing. Um, and so we're really looking at some of the new ways that industry is taking advantage of social media and digital platforms to really move in different ways of using the information from mothers, um, the way that they interact with the, the, the internet, this, the media that they put out themselves, the way that they um, respond in social media to target ads to them. Uh, to build messages, to draw them into social groups, um, ways that really were not possible when the code was originally written. Um, and the expectation is that this could lead to some strengthening of the code um, to really look at some of these new ways that marketing is happening. We have work going on around human rights um, and understanding breastfeeding within the context of, of the human rights, looking at both the rights of the mother and the rights of the child, um, but also considering the rights of industry and of free speech. What are they allowed to say? What are they not allowed to say? And how do we look at the code in that context? We're doing work on the packaging and what kinds of things are on the packaging. Do we need to strengthen the code on that? Do we need to have um, standardized packaging so that companies can't use gold lettering as ways to, to um, push their products out um, and look like there's something very special? Um, can we standardize that some, somewhat in the ways that we're doing with tobacco and plain packaging? Um, and would that be wise for us to, to do? No answers on that, but the, we're, we're looking at that uh, evidence. And of course, we always do legislative analysis and are, are in the, the process of that again to look at how countries are implementing the code in their, their laws and their regulations um, and where there are gaps and how we can address those gaps. So I just want to share a real timeline for kind of where these things are going. Um, this, uh, this body of research uh, is going to be released over the course of essentially the next 18 months. Uh, with a number of activities that multi country report should be done um, by the end of the summer. Um, we'll have guidance around the sponsorship of meetings that I talked about earlier coming out later in the year. Um, some of this human rights work later this year, moving into the digital marketing report and packaging. Um, we'll do that code status report just before the World Health Assembly next year. Um, and all of this will come together in a couple of um, kind of cumulative publications, including a Lancet breastfeeding series. Um, that will um, kind of repeat what we did in 2016 with advocacy around breastfeeding, um, but include a lot of this information about the, the breast milk substitutes um, and a big WHO report that really brings it all together. Um, each of those launches will have its own opportunity for events, webinars, ways to educate people um, and do a lot of advocacy around why we need to do more with the code. Uh, but we also have other events that we can tack on some of these, uh, these issues with. We'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary of the code on May 21st. I think that uh, Amelia mentioned that earlier. We'll be doing a large webinar around that, um, bringing countries together, telling their experiences with the code, um, and, and starting to share some of the results of some of the science. Next year, we'll have the World Health Assembly. Um, and so that code status report and the digital marketing and Lancet series will all be kind of available to the, the representatives of the World Health Assembly. Um, and hopefully we'll lead them to another resolution that would um, consider a variety of issues going forward. Certainly the digital marketing we expect would be on the agenda, um, but other issues around the, the continued application of the code. Um, perhaps of greatest interest um, to, to people today, other than just kind of understanding all of this, is that we are planning to have a global Congress bringing together representatives of ideally all countries of the world um, toward the end of 2022 um, to really look at how do we do this better? Um, so that we understand why we're doing it, we're advocating around it, but how do countries actually make it active? 
Um, what kinds of issues do they need to take on? Build networks across countries, uh, shared experiences, um, model legislation, um, sharing actions, how to deal with opposition from the industry, um, and really kind of work that out um, for countries around the globe um, come, coming to Geneva um, to really work this out. It would be hundreds of participants um, trying to, to move this. And then finally, I'm not sure I should have put it on the slide because it's not confirmed yet, but we're aiming to have some kind of a global summit on commercial determinants of child health that would probably be broader than the code itself, uh, but really try to bring together global leaders um, looking at some of these issues of how industry is shaping child health in adverse ways and get the code as a key issue within that, but might also look at issues of marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages for children, um, issues of alcohol and tobacco and how they're being pushed on children um, and kind of cast this as a, as a broader issue and make sure that the code is well situated within that. Um, that is still under development to see if we can make that happen. Um, I want to kind of start start closing out with some some thoughts about what you can do um, yourselves. So just three points uh, about uh, what you can do about the code. And the first thing on that, I think, is to educate yourselves and others. And I'm, I'm so happy to be seeing this webinar series that you're going into here to really start unpacking the aspects of the code in the U.S. context. Uh, WHO has an online training course. Uh, for how you can uh, go, go on. It's probably about three hours of really getting into the details of the code to understand all the, the legalities. I went through it in like 15 minutes. Um, it's certainly understanding all the nuances um, will, will educate you more if you're interested in, in that greater detail. We have frequently asked questions documents, um, one about the code in general and one that is really targeted to healthcare workers about their responsibilities within the code. That's much more um, digestible and easy for, for them to get into without getting into all the legalese of the code itself. Um, if, if FAN, the International Baby Food Action Network, has a number of materials to educate about the code, and you can go online to, to find those. Um, some of them you do have to pay for, but they're, they're usually quite cheap, um, just a dollar or two for some of those uh, to get access to the materials and disseminate them uh, within your own networks to educate people about the importance of the code. And of course, you can always go to, to the actual documents themselves, the code and resolutions. I kind of put that off in the corner here because I'm not sure that it's where I would start. I wouldn't start just diving into the legalist, legalistic language um, because it can get very, very cumbersome and complicated as you look at how one article interacts with another and a subsequent resolution. Um, it can be rather complicated. So I think that the, that the online training and FAQs might be a better starting point for you. Um, the second thing that I think you can do is to document the problem in the United States and publicize it. Um, there are examples of lots of reports of how this has been done before. Um, different NGOs have put out these various reports. You'll hear about the Access to Nutrition Index from Rachel momentarily. Um, Helen Keller International has done this, Save the Children, IBFAN, um, you know, various reports. And I really encourage more and more of these. Um, focus them more on the US, um, whether it's the US Breastfeeding Committee that would do that or um, subgroups within it um, that might want to publicize this. Um, if we aren't making noise, um, so that people understand what the problem is, it's going to be very difficult to get any action on it. WHO has published a study protocol on how to study what's going on with the code and, and its implementation. Um, we recognize that there are all kinds of violations across the United States, but having that well documented in a scientific way, this protocol lays out an exact protocol with questionnaires already ready for you um, that, that could be applied across the United States. So if you're connected with a science group or a university that would wanna take this on, we encourage that. Um, and there are obviously mon opportunities for anecdotal monitoring. We have our own protocol from WHO, IVFAN has a protocol, so that when you do see something, have systems where people can report those kind of violations in and just start collecting them as a, a set of, of examples. Um, they're more anecdotal, they don't have that kind, kind of scientific um, power that a, that a study might have, um, but oftentimes the anecdotes are just, just as important for people to, to see what's happening. And then finally, I ask you to start advocating. You need to advocate for restrictions on this marketing in the US and abroad. Um, we need you to be advocates. The US Breastfeeding Committee has made huge successes with moving breastfeeding forward um, without really touching on the marketing so much. Um, but I think you can only go so far as long as you have the industry pressure on all of those different forces shaping the way people think about infant feeding um, is going to make it a, an, up, an uphill battle continuously. Um, the Global Breastfeeding Collective um, that's sponsored by WHO and UNICEF have a number of advocacy materials and advocacy toolkit. 
um, that you can find a variety of these materials available for how you can do that advocacy. Um, HKI also has materials, Alive and Thrive has materials. Um, so I, I would invite you to, if you're thinking about how do we do that advocacy, there are many resources out there um, for kind of how to move it forward. Uh, but I want to just give a few specific thoughts to the US context. Um, the US, as all of you are aware, did not endorse the code. It never has endorsed the code. Um, however, in subsequent resolutions, it has urged countries to implement it. And I think that you can build on that, um, can, uh, that being part of that broader consensus. So they haven't said specifically, yes, we're 100% behind the code, um, but they are part of calling for it. Um, and therefore, I think you can say, that the, 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 U, the U.S. understands the importance of addressing the marketing, even if they're not necessarily following every specific within it. Um, the problem that we find in the U.S. is that we're always given, we're always faced with the First Amendment, um, that people say we can't restrict the marketing um, because marketing is commercial speech and that is covered by the First Amendment. Um, and while that's a powerful argument, we have many examples in public health where we are able to restrict the ways that industry can talk about its products, the kinds of markets that it's allowed to do that in, the environments, um, who we can speak to. Um, and so there are ways that it, it could be moved in the United States. However, I think that has to be a long-term strategy. In the US, there's a, there's a shared understanding of the harms of tobacco and so more of a recognition by the courts that this is an area that they can restrict free speech on. I don't think we yet have that understanding. We have to do much more advocacy um, before we're going to be at that point of being able to really change the legal situation in the US. However, there might be some things that can be done in policies. One thing that's been uh, discussed uh, among a number of the advocates is to look at procurement standards in the United States. For example, within the WIC program, there are laws about how they can procure um, the infant formula to be distributed through WIC. Um, and it is possible that there could be some, uh, some standards within that, that only companies that meet certain marketing, marketing requirements are eligible to bid or that those bids, that they get extra points for being more in line with a certain set of standards. It might not be directly tied to the code, but there might be some things that could be put in place as the standards for, um, for their uh, pro procurement within that system. So it is a, a, an area that I think is worth pursuing. So because of the difficulties of legal action, I think in the US you have to think about voluntary action. What are the kinds of things that can be done voluntarily? Um, and I wouldn't be starting with the company's voluntary action, but I would be talking about healthcare providers. I think there is an understanding, um, particularly based on pharmaceutical discussions in the US, that there is a responsibility of healthcare workers to address issues of the code. They need to be addressing issues of conf conflicts of interest. They need to be addressing their conflicts of interest with regard to pharmaceuticals and putting um, infant formula um, in the same vain as they do that with other, uh, other pharmaceuticals and the ways, the kinds of relationships that they can have with companies, where they're allowed to display uh, gifts, the kinds of gifts they're not allowed to, no, sorry, not, not gifts, but allowed to have a pen that shows this or posters on the wall. Um, there's a huge movement of that right now in healthcare. And I think that putting, showing to them their responsibilities under the code, that this is called for by the World Health Assembly. It doesn't have to be a legal action. And I think that the US Breastfeeding Committee has a lot of in with healthcare providers and ways that they could advance this agenda. I think there are some things that could be done with retailers um, to push them to, uh, to, to, to participate in the, the promotion of the code. Um, they could give um, different, different incentives to push industry in the ways that I was just talking about in the WIC program. They could have standards for the kinds of companies that they're willing to promote their products for and say, you have to be an ethical actor to promote on our, uh, our platform, or we're only going to work with you uh, um, in that way. Um, retailers themselves often are doing the promotions, um, even if it's not for the manufacturers themselves, they're just doing it for, for their own uh, sales. Um, and if they're going to, to put out a buy one, get one free as a loss leader, that is a code violation. Or if they're going to say, oh, if you buy this product, we'll also give you um, this extra little teddy bear, um, that is also a code violation. Um, and so educating them on their responsibilities, um, I think, is an area that, that we can make some progress on in the U.S. Um, and then jumping down to commercial milk formula manufacturers themselves, um, we can certainly consider name and shame, um, putting out the companies, they, they rely very much on their reputation. 
Um, and I think that's a lot of what Atme is doing is pointing out what are the companies that are doing better than other companies. Um, there's pressure from consumers. And so the more we educate and advocate with consumers about which companies are um, doing worse with regard to violating the code than other companies, um, that can shift behaviors away from those companies and they're going to feel the pressure that they need to be, uh, be more in line with the code. Um, and the investor pressure that uh, Rachel will be talking uh, about more um, is another area that these companies aren't just out there for sales, they're also out there to keep their shareholders happy. And if their shareholders are saying, look, we're not interested in investing in your company um, because you're not an ethical company, um, they're going to feel that pressure and feel that they need to, to be making shifts. The final thing I would mention is that I think in the US, you're going to have to take an incremental approach. While at the WHO, we're always looking to, in, um, to, to push the entire code, we're always talking about full code implementation. Um, the fact is that in the US, this is going to be an uphill battle. Um, and so I think starting with healthcare standards as, as a way to really focus in on that aspect of the code rather than trying to get it out of the, 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 the overall media um, might be a, an earlier win. I think addressing issues of free samples as has been done um, with the, the ban the bag campaign in hospitals, um, I think is an area that people more readily see the impacts of marketing. And so that might be an easier one to move in on. Um, and finally, I wouldn't focus on the entire context uh, of, of the code, including um, breast milk substitutes out to 36 months and bottles and teats. I know that in the US, there is a lot more expression of breast milk. And so the, the use of bottles and teats is much wider. And a lot of the, those bottles are being sold for that context. Um, and so saying that we don't actually need to focus on that in the US um, probably makes a lot more sense. Um, there's not nearly as much formula being used in the, for toddlers in the US, although it is a growing market. Um, that might be one that's just a harder sell for people. Um, and so focusing in on infant formula where there's an understanding of the vulnerability of those babies, um, you just might be able to get a, a lot more wins with that uh, earlier on. Um, so that was kind of my US context, but I just wanted to kind of close out. I'm just mentioning the international context. The US is a major player on the global stage. Um, and so often when we are trying to move things for the code um, forward, um, it is the US that is the most difficult entity. Um, in 2016, with that resolution that uh, added a number of provisions around the code, um, the, um, some representatives of the US mission here in Geneva said that they had never seen the kind of lobbying against the code that they did on that one issue. Um, the dairy industry is incredibly powerful in the United States and shapes uh, what, what, this, uh, what the administrations are looking at. And that was under the Biden administration at that time. So it's not just Republican, uh, Democrat. Um, we always see the US pushing back on these kinds of things. Um, so it's important at the World Health Assembly, at the human rights bodies, the US is often pushing back. Um, Codex is the body that sets standards for international trade of products, including infant formula and commercial uh, complementary foods. Um, and so those standards, um, whether or not they, we get weakened language, oftentimes the US is in there trying to, to weaken the language. Um, so if you can push on the United States, not just for changing your own domestic policies, um, but also to try to weaken or just tamp down some of the opposition that the US is, uh, is doing, um, it could help the rest of the world considerably. Um, oftentimes, um, the U.S. Is, is pushing its products on the rest of the world. We certainly see that in tobacco, and formula is another one of those, um, that they are happy to see breastfeeding rates going up in the United States, but around the world, um, they're protecting their markets um, to try to protect the industry, and the dairy industry is very loud in that. Um, and so I really encourage you to, whenever there are issues happening on the global front around the code, um, please step up and try to get the United States in line with um, more of the low income countries rather than being in opposition there. Uh, final take home messages, the code does still matter. It is critically important. 40 years after it was passed in 1981, we have to take action now. Um, there are many actors who have a role to play in this. It is not just the companies who are responsible for that, but we need government action, we need healthcare provider action, and the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee is well placed to, to shape the, the actions of many of those actors. But advocacy is going to be critical. This isn't going to happen just because people um, see the, the call from the, the World Health Assembly and say, okay, yes, it's time for us to do this. Um, we really have to put this in people's faces. 
Um, and I think to make action in the United States, we can't tr go after it all. We're just going to shut people down. They're not going to be interested in all of the products covered by the code. They're not going to be covered. They're not going to be interested in handling all of the different ways that marketing happens. Um, but if we can start chipping away at this problem, uh, we will start shaping people's views around this and see that, yes, we need to go further. And ultimately, maybe we can make uh, enough progress to, to get the code um, fully implemented in the United States. I want to thank you very much for your attention today and look forward to having this discussion with you later. All right. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Larry. It's always so good to hear from you. And it was a very nice overview, laid some context. Um, so with that, we're going to transition over to um, Rachel, and then we'll be back with Larry um, for a facilitated Q&A. So thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks, Amelia. Right. So good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, speaking to you from over in the UK. Um, very good to be here today. Thank you to USBC for the invitation. As Amelia said, I'm a senior advisor with the Access to Nutrition Initiative. We call ourselves ATI uh, for short. Um, and I'm going to hopefully uh, help you understand um, what we do and uh, across nutrition in general in terms of holding private sector actors to account on their contribution to improving diets and health uh, by nutrition around the world and they're very specifically looking at the work we do in respect of uh, the world's biggest baby food companies. Um, so there'll be the introduction to the organisation to start with and as I said our focus is very much on private sector accountability on nutrition. Uh, I'll talk you through how we assess uh, BMS companies marketing globally and then um, put a spotlight more on the three major BMS companies marketing in the US and touch quickly upon um, some new work ATI is doing, uh, looking at how companies lobby, um, which is also pertinent to this agenda. Uh, so our goal overall is to improve the private sector's contribution to healthy, affordable diets. Um, we have a, a, a rather expansive uh, vision uh, of a world where nobody goes to bed hungry, where everyone eats a healthy, affordable diet that has all the nutrients they need to grow and develop fully, and that deaths and illnesses from diets low in essential vitamins and minerals are confined to history. Uh, so rather a, uh, a big vision there. Um, so we aim to drive change by tracking and then encouraging the food industry to tackle obesity, diet-related chronic diseases, and undernutrition at the local and global levels. And we do this by designing and then publishing a range of private sector accountability tools, as we call them, uh, using our research and experience, and then try to leverage the knowledge and expertise of a, a global stakeholder network to, to use those tools and to help to drive that change. So it's important to explain that we do our research um, looking at materials in the public domain, but we also uh, engage with companies. We do talk to companies to um, both solicit further information from them and also we engage with them to try to explain our results and our analysis and to drive that change. And some of you might be thinking, well, how on earth is it possible for an NGO to engage in dialogue with the private sector, but remain independent? Um, and about the safeguards that we have in place to make sure there's no conflict of interest. So I perhaps uh, have a quick think to yourselves, you know, how that might be possible um, before I outline what we do. Um, we're an First and foremost, an independent not-for-profit organization. We were set up in 2013. Uh, we're based in the Netherlands, um, but we work internationally. We're a small team, there's about 18 of us total. Um, and we have a lot of principles that underpin our work. Uh, independence is absolutely front and center. We want to be objective uh, and 
rigorous in everything we do, but at the same time inclusive and take a multi-stakeholder approach. So when we develop methodologies for our tools um, and um, think about how we're going to evolve the organization, we do that through a lot of stakeholder consultation. Um, we try to be innovative and flexible at the same time and very much try to be solutions orientated. So we, we analyze what we think companies are doing well and not doing so well in terms of their performance on nutrition, but we're always looking to put forward solutions as to how they might do better. Um, and it, implicitly that's because all of the analysis that we do in the evaluation we do of companies is based on the question, are they fully aligned to international sort of goals, standards, guidelines, targets, like the code, for example, which I'll come to later. So one of the ways we safeguard our independence is we take no money from the private sector. We're funded fully by um, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, or the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So independent philanthropic organizations or government um, departments like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands and the equivalent in the UK. Uh, so no funding at all from the food industry and no representation on our independent board of directors from the industry. Um, so we all know that there is a global nutrition crisis. We have incredibly high rates of overweight and obesity around the world, about 2 billion people that suffer from those conditions and all the associated diseases. Uh, we have about 2 billion people um, who don't take in sufficient micronutrients um, and still um, 820 million by the last count people who are undernourished around the world but unfortunately the COVID pandemic probably means that that figure is going to increase so we we have a huge number of people who have inadequate diets uh, don't have good food security and as a result are um, not getting the nutrition that they need so we um, look to drive as I said the companies that um, provide many of the processed foods that uh, diets are increasingly based on. Um, we look at all dimensions of their businesses um, and we're essentially asking them and driving towards making their foods healthier and also to improving the food consumption environment. In other words, as Larry said, in terms of the code and restaurant substitutes, the businesses through their marketing and other activities very much shape the environment within which we consume their products. Um, so this is in terms of the physical avail availability and accessibility of their products, their affordability, particularly of the healthier products, and then how they market and label their products and how responsible they are in doing so. So we're looking at all those dimensions. Um, we're looking to drive companies to utilize their strengths in innovation and problem solving and marketing reach positively to solve nutrition uh, based problems and increasingly asking them to orientate their uh, advocacy, their own advocacy, i.e. lobbying and influence towards health promoting legal measures uh, as opposed to what they do currently, which is often oppose them. So um, as you can see, a big focus of our work is also uh, looking at baby food companies, uh, those that manufacture breast milk substitutes and complementary foods and looking at how responsible their marketing is. Um, and the basis of that is the code, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so essentially we publish a set of indexes. Uh, so we've published global indexes in the 2013, 2016, 2018, and there's one coming out uh, next month, the, the next one, which assesses the 25 largest food and beverage manufacturers in the world and looks at their performance across the board on nutrition. And then within that, and linked to it, we do separate analysis of the breast milk substitutes manufacturers. Uh, separately, then we develop uh, single country indexes and how uh, Amelia and I came to know each other was because we published uh, the Access to Nutrition Index for the US in 2018, the first one. We'll be publishing a second one at the end of this year. So we take the global approach, the global methodology, and then we tailor it to specific countries and markets and then produce separate indexes. The US index was uh, focused on the 10 largest food and beverage manufacturers at the time. And uh, the India index that you can see also there on the slide um, assessed 15 companies in that country. So we're increasingly looking 
subject to funding to be able to produce uh, indexes for separate countries. We also develop accountability tools for other organizations if they uh, ask us to do that or play a role in evaluating corporate performance. So I don't know if many of you have heard about the breast milk substitutes call to action that was issued uh, in the summer of last year um, by WHO, UNICEF and several NGOs. Uh, and we were asked to play the role of assessing uh, the responses of the companies to that call to action. Uh, 17 companies responded and we uh, supported the signatories by evaluating their responses and the extent to which the companies actually committed to the things that they were being asked to do within the call, of action, uh, call to action. Um, another one that's very relevant to the breast milk substitutes agenda is uh, we're now collaborating with a, a very large financial services group based in the UK, FTSE Russell, um, that has global indices and it also assesses breast milk substitute companies and we are increasingly providing research to them uh, so that they can decide which BMS manufacturers, uh, manufacturers uh, are um, able to be included in their investable indices. Um, we do other thematic research, uh, too much to read here on lots of different topics, but you'll see there at the top, um, we've started doing um, thematic research on uh, both the nutritional quality and uh, the sort of general landscape promoting um, complementary feeding in a couple of countries. So in summary, hopefully it's clear that our role is to uh, focus very much on what the private sector is doing uh, in the realm of nutrition and to try to provide tools and material to advocates, to policymakers, uh, to others, and as Larry said, investors also use our work um, to inform their work and hold the private sector to account on what they're doing in respect of nutrition. An important thing to say is that um, our, our, all of our work is very much not intended to be consumer focused. It, the, the tools and the, the research, the, the way that we operate is not supposed to, uh, or not designed to help consumers make individual choices. It, I mean, a, a very motivated consumer could absolutely, uh, or individual can, can look at our work and, and perhaps use it, but it's not designed for that. And uh, other organizations do focus much more on consumers, um, but we made the decision that our two key audiences would be the companies themselves and their investors. Um, so that's an important thing to bear in mind. So in terms of moving on now from that, that overarching context, how do we then assess companies' marketing of breast milk substitutes and increasingly complementary foods? Um, we, um, I think Larry's touched on it already. Um, you, you're probably very well aware that the baby food industry is large and, and growing, um, particularly in low income countries. Um, I think Larry and I must use slightly different sources for statistics, but we had uh, 2019 global sales of this sector of just over $72 billion and um, five companies holding 56% um, of the global market share. Um, and I wonder whether you would be able to name those five largest companies. I wonder who you think they might be. Maybe scribble those down and see if you, you can come up with them. Um, and a particularly important dynamic in this global industry is that China, the one country of China now accounts for a, around a quarter of the global market. So what, what you know, the, the demand there is, is absolutely skyrocketing. And uh, so many of the big companies are, um, have, have been for many years already trying to establish a presence and partnerships in China uh, to capitalize on that growth. So the largest companies, there you are, see if you've got them right, obviously uh, Nestle is well known and Abbott, a company called Reckitt now, just rebranded in March, previously was called RB. Prior to that was called Reckitt Bankiza um, and you would, maybe know that they uh, bought Mead Johnson Nutrition in 2017. So uh, that's the link there. Abbott also pretty large player globally and uh, China Fehu is a uh, Chinese uh, based and, and only operates in China, uh, but already has 7% of the global market. And then the rest of the, half of the global market is, is taken by 
a large number of much smaller players. Um, so in terms of where we come um, to the whole agenda of breastfe breastfeeding and, and breast milk substitute and complementary feed marketing is absolutely aligned to WHO and, and UNICEF. Uh, nutrition within the first thousand days, of course, is absolutely crucial for a child's development. We absolutely support the WHO recommendation of exclusive breastfeeding for up to six months of age, along with continued breastfeeding uh, for up to two years and appropriate instruction uh, of complementary foods at, at no earlier than six months. And we consider that the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes is the gold standard globally that all companies should adhere to voluntarily, irrespective of national regulation in the, in the countries where they sell their products. Essentially, this is um, a really critical uh, message to get through to the companies. As Larry has said, it, it is up to member states of the WHO to implement regulation nationally uh, to give effect to the code, but at the same time, companies should adopt their own policies uh, to say that they will operate according to the code, whether or not the countries that they sell their products in have done that. Um, we know that breastfeeding rates globally fall below the target that WHO has set uh, for 2025 of uh, at least 50% breastfeeding in all countries um, by then. I think the rate uh, in, in the US is fairly, uh, fairly much below that, still around 35%, maybe slightly higher now. Um, but certain regions uh, really uh, lag behind on that one. Um, so it's important to say, and Larry touched on this, that there are many different factors that influence breastfeeding and, and barriers to women being able to choose to breastfeed exactly as they would like and according to international uh, or national guidance. Um, of course, um, they need supportive employers. They need maternity and family leave. Uh, they need, if they return to work and wish to breastfeed, clean private spaces to express breast milk and store it. Uh, they need the right kinds of uh, health services, support services. They need uh, to be supported by healthcare professionals who've been trained themselves uh, to support breastfeeding. Um, and we know that there are many cultural barriers as well, all the way from sort of embarrassment around breastfeeding, um, mothers' concerns about how they feel or might feel if they breastfeed, uh, a lack of awareness of the benefits of it. Uh, and as Larry has touched on, you know, there's, there's the advice from family members, friends, cultural norms, expectations play a large role. So we can't, we can't attribute uh, lack of breastfeeding anywhere solely to the marketing of the breast milk substitute manufacturers, but certainly it plays a significant role, uh, which I think Larry has already covered. Um, so uh, in terms of then, how do we assess the extent to which, which is our bread and butter, the extent to which the world's biggest baby food companies adhere to the code. Uh, well, we have a, a methodology that assesses two things. First of all, we do a rigorous assessment of their policies and then all their internal management systems uh, to implement those policies and then their disclosure. How good is their reporting? So we look at all of that. And then uh, each time we produce a global index, we do two in-country studies in what are called higher risk countries, which are the lower middle income countries. And we use the net code protocol that, that Larry mentioned for periodic monitoring um, to assess companies' marketing practices on the ground in, in two countries. So to date, we've uh, done Vietnam and Indonesia for the first index in 2016. Nigeria and Thailand for the 2018 Global Index. We did a study in India for the India Index that I mentioned, and we're about to publish um, two studies for the Philippines and Mexico, which are feeding into our 2021 Global Index. Um, and as I've mentioned, these to date, these, these studies have always been in the higher risk countries, um, and higher risk countries are defined um, according to infant mortality and, and malnutrition rates. Um, we're advised by an expert group um, on those studies. And um, as I've said, each time we've published a, an index, then we go into a consultation period to um, consult with a wide range of stakeholders about how we could, what, was, what worked and then how we could improve. 
So essentially the output uh, of this is uh, a, a scoring and, and, and rating of the companies that we assess. Um, and so the next slide will have the ranking from uh, 2018 and also comparing the company scores to 2016 for the six largest companies globally. And again, um, I wonder uh, which companies you might expect to do the best and to do the worst against the code. Uh, maybe, again, scribble yourself a list. Uh, which do you think are the worst performing companies and the best performing companies? So this is the ranking from 2018. The darker grey bars on the left show you the scores and the lighter grey were 2016 scores. So that shows you whether companies have improved or, or fallen back. Um, a score of 100% would indicate that the company's policy fully aligns to the code and then its practices, its marketing practices within the, within the two countries assessed also fully comply with all of the code's articles and all of those subsequent WHA resolutions. Uh, so as you can see, most companies lag far behind that. Um, Danon came up in first place in 2018 with a score of 46%. So uh, you know, only one could say not even halfway to fully complying with the code, although that was a, a big improvement from 2016. Nestle was pretty much neck and neck at 45%. So similarly, um, also improved from 2016, but uh, less than down on. Uh, Abbott was third uh, with 34% in 2018. Friesland Campina, which is a big Dutch uh, cooperative, scored 25%. And the Reckitt Van Kieser, as I mentioned, RB, and then the acquisition of Mead Johnson. Um, Mead Johnson essentially scored 10% in 2018 and Kraft Heinz didn't score at all, having scored in 2016. Um, so you can see that all of these companies lag well behind the code. Uh, and if you want more information on our website, there's on the right hand side, you see the slide there, there are very detailed scorecards, multiple, multiple pages, um, each one that details very specifically um, the extent to which the policies align to the code and uh, what we found in the two countries where their marketing practices were assessed. So, um, Yes, just wanted to point you towards our website. Um, there's background information and then um, there's the library on the right. And if you use the filters, um, there's a filters in the middle of the screen that if you filter on, on that light gray uh, filter and find it, you can highlight BMS and then you can get all of the reports um, related to BMS on our, our marketing on our website if you're interested. Um, so then just to summarize how we hope that, that this work is used, we start off by publishing these in-depth indexes every couple of years. Uh, we present the results as scores and rankings, and then we make recommendations about how the companies could improve. So that's not only for the companies to respond to, but also for advocates or policymakers or others to pick up and, and amplify those messages. Um, such that then, yes, those other stakeholders are, are using our work in their own work. Uh, then we hope that the BMS companies hear these stakeholder concerns and, and, and respond to the pressure that they hear from different directions uh, and that they then improve their policies and practices. And then next time we publish an index that we can actually chart the extent to which uh, they have improved. So quickly on the US, um, I am, sure you uh, are pretty much aware that you, your, uh, the market in, in the US is, is enormous, uh, total $8 billion in 2020, with 5.5 billion of that coming from uh, milk formula. And as Larry said, uh, it's a segment that grows very fast, so it's expected to continue to grow 5.5% between 2020 and 2025. Um, we published our first US index, as I said, in 2018, that was looking at the 10 largest food and beverage companies. Um, but we also had a chapter in there looking at the extent to which the three largest companies in the US market, uh, in terms of breast milk substitutes, um, you know, what we'd found in the global index and, and what we therefore knew about how they were operating in the US, but we didn't do a, a separate ranking. We, we 
provided the context of the legal um, status of the code, uh, a little commentary on whether there was any regulation uh, linked to the code, a bit of a market context, um, a summary of the company's policies in the US market, um, drawing from the 2018 Global Index Research, but we didn't do a net code study, um, rather because we thought it was a, a foregone conclusion. If, if, if there is no regulation and the company's policies don't limit their marketing, then we knew that there would be ubiquitous marketing by all companies. Um, so that element wasn't included in the US index. Uh, and the second US index, as I say, is published um, at the end of this year, drawing from the 2021 global index, but we're not expecting to see any notable changes in respect to the US context. Um, and, and this is why I'll show you. So um, there are three major players in the US market that have 80% market share. Abbott with similar Pediasure Isomil. I'm sure you recognize those brands. Nestle with Good Start Formulas and Gerber Complementary Foods. And then uh, the rebranded Reckitt, uh, which bought those uh, brands of uh, Mead Johnson, Enfamil and Enfagro. Uh, and then, as I said, the rest of the 20% of the market is taken up by smaller players that you see at the bottom there. So these three large companies, um, first of all, we, we look at their, their, their public pronouncements, policies, commitments, and, and look at whether they seem to support the uh, intention of the code. And in fact, all of them do. So they all purport to, ex to support exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months, continued breastfeeding, acknowledge the importance of the code, et cetera. So then of course, what we do is say, well, do your policies and practices um, align to this? Uh, and we find that they don't, as you saw from uh, uh, the scores that I presented. So in terms of Abbott, um, it actually introduced a new policy in May, 2020, um, but that policy isn't any stronger, shall we say, it's no more fully aligned to the code uh, than the previous policy. It applies in the US, um, it applies globally, uh, Abbott says, for infant formulas uh, marketed as suitable for infants zero to six months of age, um, but then it has additional um, uh, commitments for follow-on formulas, which are those for six to 12 months of age, but it excludes what are, so, what are called foods or formulas for special medical purposes. So although it says we have a policy for these products and it applies in these markets, if you actually look at whether or not the wording of that policy aligns to the code, um, there is minimal alignment. So um, in other words, the fallout of that or how that, that rolls out in practice is that Abbott markets its products um, to a large degree, irrespective of the code. Um, and Abbott was one of the companies to which the, the BMS call to action was directed in the summer and it didn't make any new commitments. Uh, the commitments being asked of the companies were things like uh, full code compliance by 2030 and to make a, a substantive step forwards um, by the end of 2020 in its marketing policies and practices and things like that. So we have Abbott's uh, policy and practices lagging substantially behind the code and we do the same process with Reckitt. Um, having uh, bought Mead Johnson in 2017, it actually introduced a, a new breast milk substitute marketing policy in 2018. Again, it covers only infant formula and follow-on formula and not growing up milks, and only applies in higher risk markets and excludes formulas for special medical purposes. So lots of exclusions there, um, and therefore it doesn't apply in the US. So while the wording of the policy aligns quite well to the code, but not all of the WHA resolutions, and it's a marked improvement on the Meet Johnson policy in the US context, it doesn't change anything. And Reckitt also didn't make any commitments um, to improve its stance uh, through the BMS call to action. Uh, and the third company, quickly Nestle, its policy hasn't changed since 2017, but of all the companies, uh, the wording of that policy most clearly aligns to the code, uh, and it, it has stated commitments to every article of the code. In terms of its scope of application, it applies also to infant formula and follow-on formula, but not growing up milks, and only in high-risk markets like Reckitt, and it excludes some, but not all, formulas for special medical purposes. 
So the, the effect of that is that it doesn't apply in the US. However, Nestle did make a substantial unilateral commitment through the call to action process, and it's committed to extend its current policy by the end of 2022 in respect of infant formula products to all countries. So for the first time, it will apply its policy um, as of the beginning of 2023 in the US and Canada and Japan, for example, which are uh, so-called lower risk markets uh, that are big markets for the company. Um, we estimate that that'll encompass about $750 million worth of revenue for the company. So to unilaterally um, commit to marketing its, its products in alignment with the code in that many markets is really quite a big step forward. Um, so the conclusions that we can draw in terms of BMS marketing in the US, um, as we've understood, BMS marketing is essentially unregulated at present in the US, and, and WHO State of the Code report uh, confirmed that. Um, the largest players at present in the US market make no or very few voluntary commitments to market their products in accordance with the code. But Nestle has made that strong voluntary commitment um, from 2023, which will um, take it uh, ahead of its competitors in that sense. Um, Reckitt and Abbott's policies lag those of Nestle, as you've seen, uh, although Abbott says its policy applies for it from Fauna in the US, but its policy is very weak uh, and not very well aligned to the code, as I said. Um, so there is a um, no current monitoring, as Larry also said, of uh, marketing of these companies against the code um, using, say, the net code protocol, but that could be a very valuable accountability and advocacy tool. And um, I also concur with Larry that there's a clear need for regulation to be introduced to implement the code to be able to restrict marketing and ensure that, that mothers and caregivers receive only objective and factual information about breast milk substitutes which we hope will be one of the ways in which breastfeeding can be protected and encouraged. Um, I have a feeling I am running out of time, so I'll be very quick. I just wanted to mention that um, we are publishing a report soon where we have tried to uh, codify all the different ways in which BMS companies try to affect uh, the passage of regulation, standards, legislation, etc. Uh, globally, this is, uh, we call this a taxonomy of influence. So what are all the different routes uh, that companies lobby through? And we have taken um, a, a newly developed uh, framework called the Responsible Lobbying Framework, and we have assessed the same um, nine companies as are going to be assessed in our 2021 uh, BMS marketing index to see how they stack up against this new framework. Uh, so in other words, do they lobby responsibly? Some of you might think that's an oxymoron, um, but do they lobby in, in ways that um, is designed to advance adoption of code-based legislation and regulation? So there's going to be another score and ranking like this, uh, where 100% would, would demonstrate that they're policies and commitments and, and the way that they lobby fully aligned to this framework. Actually, some of the results are fairly encouraging. Uh, it's anonymized for now, but when you see the report published, you'll, you'll see which companies sit where. Um, but this is another potential route also for advocacy for, uh, and for, for many organizations to, to pick up this kind of thing and, and try and look at how breast milk substitute companies are, are lobbying around the world, trying to influence standards and regulation and many of you will know Lucy Sullivan, who led a thousand days until uh, probably just over a year ago, who now is CEO at Feed the Truth, uh, a new NGO, and she's very much focusing also on looking at the food and beverage sectors uh, uh, lobbying uh, in the US. So um, our, our efforts are fairly well aligned there. Um, and just to finish up, uh, just to flag to you all the reports that, that are coming out that may be of interest to you, um, so as I said, we've got a report on marketing in the Philippines coming out and Mexico in May. Then we've got this next index of the nine largest baby food companies coming out mid-June. Uh, that responsible lobbying benchmark report also in June. And then our global index uh, 2021 that looks at the food and beverage, 25 largest food and beverage companies in the world. That's end of June. 
So thank you very much. Sorry if I've gone a little bit over time, um, but very much looking forward to your questions and the discussion now. Fabulous. Alyssa, how about you? Do you want to go ahead and we can close the slide deck so that um, we can have our, our panelists. Awesome. So I'm going to start with just um, saying many, many questions. Many, many people wanted to make sure the slides and recordings are going to be available. Um, we've also been live streaming on our Facebook page. So it will. the recording is also going to be available there. We've shared out many links and the speakers have referenced various materials. We'll share all of that out with you as well. And we understand from a few attendees that adjusting which web browser you use can help with opening the links. And we have many comments saying that uh, this was just amazing work and very, very grateful to the speakers for the time today. So I want to start with a quick question over to you, Rachel. Um, many people are hoping that you're going to assess the United States again, um, particularly because we have a high infant mortality rate and obviously we're quite concerned about that. So my question is, what support do you need, does ATNI need, um, in order to assess the US again? Thank you, Amelia. Um, so there's two parts to the answer. We assess the company's policies in the first instance, as I said, and the management systems and disclosure. Somebody asked whether the, uh, the, they, the companies give us their policies. They don't need to because they're, they're in the public domain, actually. So anybody can, can find them and, and read them. Uh, what we do is try and make it easier to, to understand how closely they map to the code and don't. Um, so because we're doing that assessment of the nine largest companies, including the three Nestle, Dan, I'm sorry, Nestle, Abbott and uh, Reckitt that we were just looking at, because we're doing that for the global 2021 index anyway, we essentially you can you can draw the conclusions, which I just presented, that the policies don't apply in the US anyway. So, so there's no need to do a separate exercise on that because we know precisely uh, that, you know, what is and isn't done in the US. Uh, in terms of then doing one of those, what we call a net code study to use the net code protocol for periodic monitoring, um, in order to do a study like that, uh, essentially, we, we need funding from a, a philanthropic organization uh, to do that. Um, we would partner usually with a local, um, local as I mean, it would be in this case, a, a US based uh, institute research uh, agency, a university, and we do it in partnership, um, but it's simply, in inverted commas, simply a, a matter of, of finding the funding uh, and support from local stakeholders to do that. Wonderful. Thanks, Rachel. All right, so Larry, I'm going to zoom way out for the qu a question to you. Um, thinking that you'd be able to help us understand a little bit about how marketing has changed over the last 30 years. Um, and in particular, how are you seeing formula companies marketing to underserved communities? Okay, so um, it, it's a little bit hard to say um, in a scientific way because we didn't really have great monitoring early on on the code. Um, we still don't have fantastic systems, but I think we have a, a better um, a modality um, with the, the net code protocols that Rachel was talking about. Um, so some of this is anecdotal, but I would say that um, the, the tactics have certainly changed. Much more use of digital marketing than there was 30 years ago when we didn't have uh, phones that could uh, carry these messages all the time around us. Um, it's certainly gotten much more sophisticated in terms of the kinds of messages that companies are coming to, to, to women with and in general. It's not always about their products. It's often about them as an entity. It's about making relationships, building a, a closer contact with mothers. Um, in ways that they weren't able to do before. Um, there's also a shift toward much more marketing of products for uh, older children. Um, so um, the industry has kind of shifted away from the first six months into these other products. I think as they see more and more of the pressure uh, against marketing uh, in the first six months of, of life, doesn't mean they aren't doing it still, but it, it has shifted toward these other products that they've created for themselves. Um, some things are not as bad, um, and certainly in low-income countries, some of the, the egregious violations that you saw 30 years ago um, have been um, clamped down with, with some good legislation. Um, but usually what the industry does, they don't stop marketing, they just find other ways that aren't quite as obvious as they were uh, 30 years ago. 
Awesome, thank you. Thanks so much, Larry. So I'm going to, um, there's several different attendees that have asked questions related to calling out particular organizations and institutions um, related to you know, concerns for their practices. So I wanted to um, check in with Rachel and see if you have any suggestions um, about what to do. You know, what, what would you recommend that advocates do when you see that there's this disconnect between a role and a mission of an organization and the fact that they're actually taking formula money and it sets up a conflict. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, certainly directly write to the company, uh, email, Facebook, uh, you know, dig up the chief executive's name and send a letter to the headquarters, the head of global public affairs, wh whoever's name you can find, uh, but write directly and quite formally, I would say, and cite precisely the commitments that the companies make in the public domain, and then bring uh, to their attention the fact, uh, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, uh, that is counter to what they publicly state they're committed to doing. Um, I think Larry can probably better um, answer questions about uh, more how uh, advocates or others can collate sort of examples of this uh, and then bring bring them to the attention of organizations like the WHO or UNICEF and or then how that can be packaged into kind of advocacy so I think Larry could probably hand over to you on that one. Yeah Larry do you have more you want to add on that before we go to the next question? So I did mention that we'll be coming out with uh, some guidance later this year that really focuses in on sponsorship of, of scientific meetings and the, and the relationships that these professional associations have. So I'd use, use that kind of thing that say, look, World Health Organization is calling on this. It's a new resolution, resolution backed by all members uh, of the, the WHO. Um, so this is you know, a big call on all of them to, to get their awareness. I think highlighting examples of organizations that have taken stronger policies uh, are always good. Um, you know, the, the Royal College of Pediatric Health um, has taken a stance that they're not going to take any funding from industry. The WIC program has said they're not going to let industry um, exhibit any more at its uh, meetings. Um, so I think holding up those good examples are good. And that this, is, this is needed across the board and that is part of what the, uh, the code calls for. So I think oftentimes it's, it's just they don't even recognize that it's that it's against the rules. They think that because, oh, we put up a firewall that they can't affect our um, content, that that's good enough. And, and we're really saying that there's a conflict of interest. It's not just content that's being affected. Well, I really appreciate what I'm hearing you say of lifting up the good actors, not just calling out those that um, are bad. If we can really perhaps build up a mechanism where there's a good get for those who are, you know, that we're going to celebrate and amplify those who are doing the right thing. It's exciting. Can um, I add so, one thing, Amelia? Sorry. Oh, yeah. can I add oh no, absolutely, Rachel, please. So also it reminds me, I realize I should have said, so all of these companies actually have a, an anonymous whistleblowing mechanism. Uh, always, again, you can find it on their websites and you can fill in forms and submit examples of where they are marketing counter to their commitments um, or to the code. And the good thing about using those systems is the companies have, have made their own promises and they, they do do this, but they, they have to, and they have a system internally to investigate and then co comment on every single one of those and come back to the complainant. And so actually, if a lot of people were to do that all at once using those systems, uh, you would, you know, that would um, make quite a big impact on those companies in terms of them seeing a lot of examples and having to respond to them. Um, so I would use that route. Uh, again, you can just get on the, you know, use a, a browser and, and just Google or something, use something else and put, you know, I don't know, Nestle or Abbott whistleblowing, and it should take you to their systems. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel and Larry both. So for the final question, um, since we're, we're closing down our webinar time scheduled for today. Um, so Larry, we've been hearing from many different really large organizations that there has recently been a shift to require that if perinatal education pieces in particular um, give equal time to formula um, as to um, chest and breastfeeding and curriculums. And I know a lot of people who are responsible for figuring out how to build such curriculums would be very grateful to hear from you on the WHO perspective of 
um, you know, how, what, you know, what, what do you think of curriculums doing that and or do you have any guidance about how best, if put in that position, how best to handle that? So it's kind of strange to say equal um, because we certainly wouldn't want the exception to be given equal weight. Um, but if we're at a point that we're getting so little attention to breastfeeding now, I suppose it's a move in the right direction. Um, I would say, you know, who, who needs these formulas? There is a need for these formulas, let's, let's be honest about it, but it probably is on the order of four or 5% of women that actually need infant formulas. Um, and so pushing in that direction of saying, look, you need to be supporting the 95% of women who are breastfeeding, or at least the 95% that should be breastfeeding. There's no, no biological reason that they, they can't be. Um, and so pushing in that direction is absolutely necessary. Uh, right now, a lot of that, um, uh, the, the, the funding for their education is coming from the formula companies about their products. Um, and so finding, finding that, you know, shifting that toward 50% away from what was nine, now more like 90% is certainly moving in the right, right direction. I'd be careful about putting that in policy though, because um, it, it makes it hard to then move beyond that. Uh, going going forward, so I think it's it's a strategic decision uh, of how much you, you go for the incremental. Um, we have to take some incremental things, but when we when we put policy on incremental approaches, um, it, it can can backfire down the road. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so with that, we need to conclude the webinar today. Um, we're very pleased to have so many attendees, um, including those who tuned in live on Facebook for our streaming today. Um, the recording and all of the um, materials that have been shared out um, will be available to everyone who um, registered for the event, whether you were able to attend live or not. Um, and USBC is going to continue this conversation both with the webinar series as it continues, um, and then in conversations among member organizations as we consider together what may be the best way to organize and begin to work towards a nation that is more supportive of breast and chest feeding. So thank you so much again to our speakers, Larry and Rachel, and to everyone who attended today. We'll see you in June. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.